We've spoken a few times about how weird the Triassic was, and one group that really showcased this were the giant galloping land crocs. One of which was big enough to take down the sauropods of its day as the biggest non-dinosaur terrestrial carnivore in Earth's history. Now the Rausukians are the group in question, one that I have talked about in a lot more extensive detail in my Triassic Weirdos video. This was a group of crocodilians that dominated the land during the Triassic, so much so that they helped hold the dinosaurs at bay from taking over for the majority of the period. These croc relatives differed mostly in their land adaptations, having relatively longer legs that were held underneath the body and skulls that a casual onlooker might mistake for a dinosaur. Now the most famous of these was the Postosuchus, thanks to its appearance in Walking with Dinosaurs back in 1999. But I would still much rather find that guy in my back garden than this one. The Fasolosuchus. This guy has garnered quite a bit of attention recently as an antagonist for the movie 65. But Fasolosuchus tenax was actually named back in 1981 by Jose Fernando Bonaparte when he found skull remains along with a partial femur, radius, fibula and a few vertebrae in the Ishiguelasto Villa Union Basin in northwestern Argentina. And not many remains have turned up since this initial find, so most of what we know about this animal has come from very close relatives. Like other Rausukians, Fasolosuchus was a quadrupedal carnivore, resembling their crocodile cousins with the exceptions to their shorter skulls and longer legs that were held underneath them. This group, along with the dinosaurs, were amongst the first to adopt this kind of gait, meaning their success was skyrocketed, since this allows the animal to run faster, longer, and more efficiently. So despite its huge size, this animal was surprisingly quick when compared to the large predators that came before the Rausukians. The skull at a glance could have been easily mistaken for that of a theropod dinosaur, with hugely powerful jaws lined with recurved serrated teeth. We also see a skull that was wider at the back than it was at the front, meaning it had some degree of binocular vision, allowing some depth perception which is an important feature for a predator. Going beyond the skull, the limbs were approximately 30% shorter at the front than they were at the back, causing many to speculate whether or not these guys were actually quadrupedal obligates, or if some portion of their locomotion was carried out with a bipedal gait. Another unusual trait for this group, Fasolosuchus is thought to have only sported a single row of osteoderms, which are bony plates in the skin often used for protection or thermoregulation, along its back, as opposed to the usual two rows. This might go to show that this beast didn't need a lot of protection due to its sheer size. Oh yeah, speaking of size, Fasolosuchus was most definitely not as big as what we see in 65, but a change in underwear would still be needed if you saw this thing in the wild. Rausukians got pretty huge during the Triassic, with members such as Prestosuchus and Saurosuchus reaching up to 7 metres or 23 feet in length. But Fasolosuchus took the title by clocking in at a whopping 8 to 10 metres or 26 to 33 feet long, and anywhere between 3 to 4 tonnes in weight. This would crown Fasolosuchus as the biggest terrestrial predator in Earth's history that isn't a dinosaur. Not only that, but this huge mass also meant that Fasolosuchus was not only capable of, but likely to have hunted nature's universal measurement for classifying whether or not it was a big mofo predator, sauropods. As to what kind of sauropods, well let's take a look at its environment. The Los Colorados Formation was laid down in Argentina during the Norian stage of the Late Triassic, around 227 to 213 million years ago. This area at the time was a fluvial and lake estuarine environment, meaning it was rich in rivers and lakes, with plenty of seasonal floodplains, mostly dictated by mega monsoons. Now the world at the time had a single supercontinent called Pangaea, but this area in particular was roughly as close to the western coast as it is today, with the many river systems leading out to it. This meant that it wasn't quite as dry and arid as many characteristic areas during the Triassic but many dry spells are seen through the abundant gypsum deposits along with surrounding active volcanoes. The fauna living here included primitive turtles, synapsids such as Yakularia and Tessalacia, other Pseudosuchians such as Neatosauroides, Rioyasuchus, Coloradosuchus, Hemiprotosuchus and Pseudohesperosuchus, along with the newly emerging dinosaurs like Coloradosaurus, Poelvinator, Rioyasaurus, Zipasaurus, and the biggest animal known from this formation, Lessomsaurus. Now more animals may have been present that were from the Ishiguelasto formation that lies underneath, 
since there is overlap between these two as we see a gradual shift. So we might have seen more famous names like Herrerasaurus, but this isn't confirmed with fossil evidence. We need to get back to the biggest animal of the time though. Lessamsaurus was a basal sauropod that grew to be around 10 to 12 meters or 33 to 39 feet long and possibly up to 10 tons. Now exact bite force estimates for Phosodosuchus haven't actually been made, but it is thought that this guy along with Saurosuchus show an increase in bite force when compared to other Rausukians. The earlier guys really didn't need strong bites for their size when compared to say theropods, since their prey was a lot smaller. However, Phosodosuchus appears to show adaptations convergent with theropods that were used to take down much bigger prey, such as the special adaptation in the spine known as the hypersphene hypantrum articulation, which is basically where a protrusion from one vertebrae slots nicely into a depression into the vertebrae behind it, increasing rigidity and stabilism. This adaptation is seen in one other Rausukian, the Saurosuchus, so this adaptation must have been in response to the growing prey size meaning that Phosodosuchus was more than capable and, considering its caloric needs, very much likely to have hunted Lessamsaurus. Or Adam Driver, apparently. Now, vertebrates getting big isn't exactly a new idea, but you have to remember that this was the Triassic. This was a time in which all the world had seen so far was fauna that didn't really get bigger than today's animals. So the fact that Vasodosuchus got this big goes to show that the evolutionary arms race for size was well and truly underway. Now whenever we are looking at massive creatures, it's always worth asking, how quickly did they get to that size across their lifespan? Especially when it comes to reptiles. It's a well-known fact that reptiles for the most part laid eggs rather than giving birth to live young. And we have no reason to believe that Vasodosuchus was any different. The only problem with eggs is that there is a hard and fast size limit for them. Eggshells have many functions, but one of them is to facilitate oxygen transfer to the fetus inside. And in order to do this effectively, the shell can only be so thick. This means that there is a limit on the size that the egg can reach before it needs a thicker shell to support itself, which would be too thick for oxygen transfer to take place. Now the size limit is roughly that of an ostrich egg, meaning that the fetus inside can only be so big too. So when we look at giant reptiles, we can only surmise that they had scary fast growth rates to hit such sizes in a single lifetime. Histological studies, or looking into the internal microstructure of a bone, carried out on Phosodosuchus determined that this guy did indeed have a fast growth rate. There was some discrepancy between the bone showing full skeletal maturity and levels of matrix and vascularization showing sexual maturity. Now this can only mean one of two things. One, sexual maturity was only reached after the animal was fully grown physically, which is a feature that's only actually seen in birds. Or two, that it had a feature seen in certain dinosaurs and tuataras that meant different bones had different growth rates. Since we don't have a full skeleton, we can't compare these growth rates across the whole skeleton. So if it is the latter, did Phosodosuchus actually get bigger? I'll let you guys have a think on that and write your thoughts down below whilst I answer this week's question, which comes from... Just in case, AAA, who has asked, what is the closest living relative to Tychoda sharks? Okay, so for anyone that doesn't know, Tychodus was a really weird genus of shark from the Cretaceous that potentially grew to be around 30 feet and had these really weird teeth that looked more like flattened mammoth teeth. Now this shark actually falls into the family Tychodon today uh, and to be honest, it's really not known where this group falls into because only the really weird teeth have been found. In fact, no one actually knows where to put them within elasmobranchs, which does include sharks, but it also includes rays, skates, and swordfish. So there's a small chance it might not have even been a shark. The likelihood appears to be that it kind of diverged off a long time before modern sharks did, so all modern sharks alive today are probably all about as closely related to Tychodus as each other. Yeah, I'm really sorry I couldn't give you a better answer on this one, but it would appear that even the Chondrichthys experts, which I am not one, are a little bit unsure on this. On the upside though, whenever you ask a question that no one actually knows the answer to, it's a sign that you're asking the right questions. So if you have a question that you'd like me to answer, be sure to drop it in the community post that I'm going to be dropping soon where I'll be taking those questions. Or if you feel you can't wait, patrons get to ask me whatever they want, whenever they want, and I will answer it in subsequent videos, so check out the link below. 
Catch you guys next time.